Let us pay homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Let us take the three refuges. Buddhang saranang gachami, Dhammang saranang gachami, Sangang saranang gachami, Dutiampi buddhang saranang gachami, Dutiampi dhammang saranang gachami, Dutiampi sanggang saranang gacami, Tatiampi buddang saranang gacami, Tatiampi damang saranang gacami, Tatiampi sanggang saranang gacami. Okay, we shall now chant the verses to observe the five precepts. Panati pata veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Adinadana veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Kame sumicha chara veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musa vada veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura meraya maja pamadatana veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Welcome all of you to our Buddhist Fellowship Sunday service. Thank you all for coming along to this talk. Today we are very honoured and grateful to have Bhante Buddha Rakita who took the time away from his busy schedule to give us a talk all the way from Uganda. A very warm welcome to Bhante. Today, uh, Bhante is going to talk on a, on a topic called the Alaga Dupama Sutta or the Water Snake Simile. Now, um, I'm going to give a short introduction uh, to Bhante. I'm sure he's known to many of you, but let me give a short uh, bio. Venerable Bhante Buddha Rakita was born in Uganda, Africa. He first encountered Buddhism in 1990 while studying and living in India. He was ordained as a Buddhist monk by the late Most Venerable Yu Silananda in 2002 at the Tathagata Meditation Center in San Jose, California. He then spent eight years under the guidance of Bhante Gunaratana or Bhanteji, as we all fondly address him by at the Bhavana Society in West Virginia. Bhante Buddha Rakita is the founder and abbot of the Uganda Buddhist Center. Besides spending time at the UBC, he is also a visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary in New York City and the spiritual director of Radiance Retreat Center in Mississippi. He is a long-time member of the Global Buddhist, Global Buddhist Relief Advisory Council in New Jersey. He has been teaching mindfulness meditation in Africa, the US, and worldwide, and also in Singapore since 2005 and he is very much well-loved in many countries. He has also written a book, Planting Dharma Seeds, The Emergence of Buddhism in Africa. So Bhante, a very warm welcome. Over to you, Bhante. Please, may I invite you to give us a Dharma talk? Okay, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. And uh, I'd like to start uh, with the Sutta study with our meditation. So let us sit comfortably and uh, meditate for 20 minutes. Uh, let's start now, all right? Okay. Sit comfortably, feel at ease. 
let go of the past and future. You can close your eyes or half closed or half open, whichever you prefer. Or you can open them, it's up to you. The key is to focus on more on the inner journey, not so much outside what you're seeing with your eyes. This is time to become aware of different mind states, bodily sensations. You can begin with taking a few slow, deep breath to oxygen, oxygenate the blood and relax. See if you can be aware of the sound around you or within you. And simply be aware of hearing. We, we begin with mindfulness of sound because sound, sound points to the natural quality of mindfulness. The object of sound appears and we're present. We don't have to make it come or go, but you can be aware. Sometimes there's silence, there's no noise, there's no sound. Simply be mindful of the silence, silence itself. And then we move on from mindfulness or hearing. We become aware of the whole body sitting here. So it's called mindfulness of the body. From the top of the head to the toys, be aware of the whole body, your eyes, nose, jaws, chest, abdomen, knees, ankles, wherever there's a tension, see if you can let go of that tension. Sometimes the tension is accumulated in the shoulders throughout the day. See if you can let go or release that tension. Once you finish mindfulness of the whole body, now you can be mindful of what the body is doing. Chances are that the body is breathing. Can you be mindful of the breath? I invite you to be mindful of the body breathing. The body is breathing, the mind knows that the body is breathing. It's that simple, don't complicate it. So you see if you can sustain your attention as you become aware of the breath, from the beginning of in-breath to the end of it. Breathing of out, the beginning of out-breath to the end of it. So see if you can sustain your attention all the way. The breath lasts only for a few seconds. See if you can pay undivided attention to the breath. As you breathe, sometimes there's some sensation of the breath, warmth, coolness, touching sensations, movement itself of the breath. See if you can see the beginning and the end of it, the rising and passing out of the sensations. So with meditation, you have to be mindful of the rising and passing away aspect of the ex every experience when we practice Vipassana meditation. So it's about sustaining our attention. And it's about seeing the rising and passing our aspect of every experience. As you breathe, sometimes thoughts arise that take away your mind from a main object. Simply be aware of thinking, wondering, mind wandering. Maybe it's feelings arising, maybe it's emotions, maybe thoughts of the past and future. 
again, we expand our awareness to embrace all whatever is arising in our meditation experience. The principle here is be aware of whatever is arising in the present moment whenever it becomes prominent. Atu Pama Yasabesan Satam Sukamato 
Pasitwa kamatomita sabbasati subhavai. Having seen that all beings like oneself have a desire for happiness, one methodically develops loving kindness for all beings. May you be well, happy and peaceful. May all beings be well, happy and peaceful. May you be well, happy and peaceful. May all beings be well, happy and peaceful. May you be well, happy and peaceful. May all beings be well, happy and peaceful. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, good. Yes. Mm. So now, I'll start the sutta. Mm? Yes. Namo dasa bhagavato arato samma samdasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arato samma samdasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arato samma sambuddhasa. My Dhamma brothers and sisters, today I would like to uh, explain to you uh, about this beautiful discourse. Mm -hmm. It's this beautiful discourse, it's found in a book uh, called Majjima Nikaya. Mm -hmm. It's the middle length discourses. And the sutta is, in English, is called the Simile of the Snake. Ala Dhamma Dupama Sutta. Uh, upama means uh, simile, and uh, Ala Gadu is a, a kind of a snake. Actually, it's a water snake. Uh, this water snake, I've never seen it. I've seen water snakes, but this particular one I've never seen. And uh, but what I know is water snakes are very poisonous, very, very poisonous. So in the Sutta, we don't know that whether it's very poisonous, but I know uh, before I became a monk, I was a scuba diving instructor and I used to meet water snakes under the ocean. And I heard that this snake is one of the most poisonous snake, but it can only bite around the ears. <laughs> so <laughs> you cannot bite anywhere apart from small areas and uh, if it bites you they say that within a few seconds you are dead so uh, but we we get some idea that this is actually a water snake all right though in the sutta uh, we see the simile of the snake but it's a kind of a water snake that name you know there are many others so in this sutta we are going to look at 10 points that are given actually headings. Like there is a setting, there is a simile of the snake, there is a simile of the, the raft, standpoints for the views, agitation, impermanence and non-self, uh, then the arrow ant, uh, misconception of the Tathagata, not yours, the uh, Indis Dhamma, right? Those are the 10 headings. Uh, that we are going to see um, uh, together and then explain some of the things that I understand. Uh, I don't know uh, how you understand the sutta, but uh, let me hope that you have read the sutta, right? The sutta is lengthy, it can take even three hours to explain, but I, I will just pick up the most important points, right? That are worth noting. And uh, maybe I will cross reference you to other discourses. So we start with the sutta. Now, of course, I'm not going to read a sing every single word, but I'll just uh, tell you some of the points that probably you need, you need to know and we need to share, right? That's how I had, of course, you know, that means uh, Ananda was being quoted there. That is the one who, yeah, yeah. So who recorded this sutta? So that's how I had. On, the, on, on one occasion, the blessed one, was living in Sabbath in the Jeta's Grove and attended Pindika Park. Now, on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in a bhikkhu named Arita, formerly the vulture killers. Thus, this is the view of this Arita. 
as I understand the Dharma taught by the blessed one, the blessed one, the Buddha, uh, those things called obstructions by the blessed ones are not uh, are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. So basically, what this means actually is uh, though they don't say exactly what these obstructions are. But uh, when you read our Vinaya, uh, actually these obstructions point to the, uh, some of the things the Buddha mentioned in our monastic tradition, that uh, in a relationship with the, uh, with the, uh, with the female uh, is obstruction to the path, right? And since Adita was, is, is a bhikkhu, he said, no, 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 this is not obstructions. Right? <laughs> yeah, in fact, Arita was maybe referring to things like we find in, in our Vinaya, which, uh, and even some discourses, we find that lay people, they can attain Arahan, I mean, sorry, can attain stream entry, but still they're householders, right? And then now uh, they can even attain the second level of enlightenment, right? <laughs> And if Arita was saying, no, why we monks are told not to, to engage in any household activities, you know? If, if we monks also want to attain stream entry and let people are uh, recorded in the suttas that have attained stream entry and even second level of enlightenment <laughs> and even third level of enlightenment, only when they reach the fourth level of enlightenment, Arahanship, you cannot be a householder. You have gone, you have already eradicated greed, hatred, and delusion, you know? Yes. So, um, I'm sorry, uh, sorry, you have already eradicated the greed, hatred, and delusion then when you are other hand. So, you cannot engage in any of the, these uh, obstructions. So, I think that's where he was confused that we monks, we should not actually be stopped from engaging in this uh, relationship with the females. Yeah, so the sutta doesn't say it, but that's what it points to. So the, the, this monk is saying, no, 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 this cannot obstruct our path, we monks. Actually, if we engage in them, also we can attain stream entry, just like lay people. So it, it's as if you were seeing it as an uh, obs uh, uh, obstacle, basically. Why is, he didn't see the reason why he's stopping the monks, yet lay people can attain stream, attain stream entry. So that's what it means, actually that uh, is talking basically on sensual pleasures. Uh, is really talking about the what? Sense of sensual pleasures, uh, that they're not obstructing the path. Yeah? And the Buddha had pointed to them, uh, and uh, in many places that it's really an obstruction. Uh, and then this man is, uh, Buddha called him Mogapulisa, misguided man. Right? <laughs> Every time Buddha, had some people like this who are bare, who had the wrong views. He was calling them misguided, right? Moga police, misguided man. Now, the Buddha gave a series of uh, similes that I'm, I'm I'm not going to go through all these similes. There are about ten of them. I will list them, just listing them. One is about a skeleton, piece of meat, a grass torch, pit of coal, dream, bold goods fruits on a tree, butcher's knife, uh, and, uh, and then he talks about butcher's knife and block, a sword, and uh, sword stake, and the uh, snake is head. What I like more about these similes is that they really bring out what sensual pleasures are like, right? Uh, for instance, even borrowing goods, uh, if you borrow, go borrow some goods, maybe a shirt, and you go to the wedding, and uh, and then uh, you don't give it back and somebody can come and say, hey, why, give me my shirt, you know? So you get embarrassed basically. So now those suttas, uh, I mean, these similes, there are so many, I'm not going to explain them, they are very straightforward. But all these, so these similes, they point out to three, two points major, but it's really connected to the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha gave a talk in a, a sutta called Upali Sutta. It's in the uh, Majima Nika 56, it's called Upali Sutta, uh, where the Buddha talks about three things actually that you need to know, but in this case, is addressing two things only. The Buddha has talked about the gratification 
of the five aggregates. It talks about the gratification of the sensual pleasures. In this case, in Pali Sutta, it talks about the danger of the sensual pleasures, right? And also it talks about escape. In the Upali Sutta itself, he goes beyond that. He goes to the danger, defilement, and degradation, what I, I call uh, 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 tri triple D. If you can remember triple D, that's what essential pleasures are about. <laughs> right? It's, it's danger, there's danger in them, and the more, still more danger, and then they defile the mind, the, 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 which means the more the indulge in these um, the mental defilements, the sensual pleasure in this case, the more it becomes stronger next time. And also it talks about degradation. Of course, in the, this sutta, the simile of the snake, the Buddha don't talk about the defilements and degradation, but those, those, these teachings are all over the suttas uh, in, in Sanyuta Nikaya and different places in Majima Nikaya, where the Buddha talks about you should know the gratification, that means the little enjoyment we get. And even he said, the Buddha said that if there was no little enjoyment in essential pleasures, people will not enjoy, you know, but there is. So there's a gratification of essential pleasures, there's a danger, defilement, degradation, and the third is escape. In, in other words, how do we uh, uh, escape from these essential pleasures? The Buddha here, uh, straight away doesn't go into those three things I'm talking about, but the similes point to that, that that's what we need to know. We should not stop at gratification and stop at the danger, but also we should escape later on the sutta. We'll talk about how we can uh, let go the non-attachment. This is very, very important to know, actually, right away, uh, uh, because every sutta points up to that uh, point of the gratification of essential pleasures and the danger inherent in them. So that's what you need to know in this, uh, all these similes, the 10 of them, read them, please. And then we continue on. The Sutta talks about, uh, of course, uh, when he talks about these similes, the Buddha talks about uh, the simile of the snake head. Uh, the blessed one has stated that sensual pleasures, I'm on page 225. Uh, the blessed one has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more, right? So uh, read them and you will find out yourself. The, the, the similes are very graphic to show you how the, 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 there is danger in them and all this kind of thing. So now uh, the rest of the suttas uh, really st straightforward. Let's see about the simile. It's all pointing to uh, bhikkhus on page 227. Uh, that's where uh, we are going on number nine, uh, subsection nine. Uh, that concludes that part of the setting of the sutta. Bhikkhus, that one can engage in sensual pleasures without sensual desires, without perception of the sensual pleasures, without thought of sensual pleasure. That's impossible. In other words, it's really impossible not to have those perceptions of, of sensual desires and uh, without thoughts of sensual desire. So really, everything we engage in, right? we really actually, you cannot engage in those relationships without the uh, thought of sensual desire, without the perception of sensual desire. So that's why the Buddha said, please keep them at bay at least there. Uh, the people who are following monastic life, he, he told them to keep them at bay. So uh, now, uh, this is the setting of the sutta number one. We go straight away to the simile of the snake. As, uh, I think when I visualize those snakes, uh, that I saw them myself, water snakes, they are slippery. <laughs> so one can imagine holding on to them and then they, they escape you. <laughs> <laughs> and then they can come and bite you because a snake with water, you can see why, why did the Buddha, why didn't the Buddha use the cobra, right? But also the cobra could be actually slippery, but he's talking about a water snake actually, right? So that means this water is going to be slippery, you know? So, and uh, with that uh, uh, external environment uh, of water, and uh, so one can imagine how delicate uh, the, the Dharma is, you know? <laughs> yes. So now we are going to go to the simile. Uh, this simile points 
to one point, basically, improper handling of the Dhamma. Hmm? We should handle the Dhamma properly, but this simile of the snake is actually where do you handle when the snake is there, right? Because the Dhamma can be medicine, but also it can be poison. Right, it's medicine when you handle it properly, and in many ways, the Buddha referred to his teaching as medicine, you know. But it can be also poison. This, uh, this is called uh, what you call a paradox, venom, venom paradox, right? So, you know, people when they want to, uh, uh, when people are bitten by a snake. Uh, they get venom actually because it's been preserved in a refrigerator and uh, stored properly and added some preservative probably. So now uh, when you do this, the same venom can be poison <laughs> from a snake. The same venom is used to treat people who are bitten by snake, all right? This is called venom, uh, venom paradox, right? So the same thing, the Dharma, uh, it seemed to be a paradox there. The same Dhamma can really liberate us. And if we hold by, the, like the snake, you hold it by the head, right? So you hold it by the head, so the snake doesn't even open <laughs> to bring the, 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 the fungus, the fangs to inject the poison. But if you just handle by the tail, it just turns like this. <laughs> First, it can even slip away from your hand. <laughs> and then it can, if it doesn't slip away from your hand, it can just, you hold it in, by the tail, it just turn the head and bite you, all right? So the same, many, many teachings I've seen it. Many teachings I've seen like that, most people, they mishandle them and then later on bites them. Instead of this teaching empowering people, they disempower them. One of them is the, the teaching on the law of karma, all right? They take it to be like uh, what we call deterministic views, right? Everything good, good they attribute to God. Bad things, oh, this person has a bad karma. <laughs> so they misunderstand the teaching on karma. Even the teaching on suffering, people misunderstand it. Suffering, you know? People misunderstand many teaching. Mm? Many, many teaching the Buddha gave. Uh, even There's not enough time to mention, to mention one by one that is commonly understood, including Karama Sutta. Most people use Karama Sutta to say they don't believe in Dharma, you know? So, and the, the, the Karama Sutta talks about believing in what is wholesome and after examination, you know? So these are the things uh, that we see, even the teaching of the Four Noble Truth, the truth, Dharma, actually when they refer to Dharma here in the Sutta, we are looking at the, the truth, you know? So now even the teaching on the Four Noble Truth, most people misunderstand it. They saw the Buddha taught only suffering. They're not patient enough to look at what other truth the Buddha taught, aspects of the truth, cause of suffering, cessation of, uh, of suffering, and then the, the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. Every time I go to people, say, oh, you Buddhist is pessimistic, you know? Uh, you talk about suffering only. So many, many actually teaching are being misunderstood because people have wrong views. All right, the simile of the snake. Uh, come up with a few things that I, I need to uh, uh, mention. One of them is the oldest way of class classifying the Dhamma. The oldest way of classifying the Dhamma is very interesting. Now we know that the Dhamma is being ca classified in different categories, and uh, we have suttas, we have uh, Abhidhamma, we have Vinaya. That came later on. The oldest classification of Dhamma is I'm going to read them. One is sutta, discourses. Gaya, gatas used for chanting. You know? I even chanted one gatas. Atupamaya, sabesa, satanams, suko kamato, pasitwa kamato, meta, sabasate, These are called gatas. We find them in, in Dhammapada. Then we have Gaya Karana, which means expositions of the Dhamma. Then these verses, we find them in Udana, exclamations. Then we have what we call sayings, bad stories. We have marvels, right? We find the, all the, these discussions uh, in these books. Mm? We find also Vedala. Vedala, we, Chula Vedala and Mahavedala. This is question and answer. So when you look at this snake, 
uh, the symbol of the snake, it really introduced the oldest classification of the Dharma according to the Buddha. That's how the Dharma was classified a long time, right? So that one you should also take note of it. But more so, the very important thing to, to really to take note of is those teachings, I'm on page 227, those teachings, eh? okay, let me really actually read it straight out so that you get it. He, uh, the symbol of the snake, here because some misguided men learn the Dharma, discourses, stanzas, exposition, verses, exclamations, sayings, bad stories, marvels, and answers to questions. But having learned the Dharma, they do not examine the meaning of these teachings with wisdom. Not examining the meaning of this teaching with wisdom, they do not gain a reflective acceptance of them. Instead, they learn the Dharma only for the sake of criticizing others or for winning in debates, and they do not experience the good for the sake of which they, they learn the Dharma. Those teachings being wrongly grasped by them conduce to their harm and suffering for a long time. Why is that? Because of the wrong grasp of the Dharma. Now, so now, uh, this is very, very important to remember, is that most people, they learn bits and pieces of the Dharma, the juicy one, which they feel that it will win the debates if they are cornered or what. So then they just argue about this, about this. So this, are, we have seen it in the history of Buddhism, actually. People are just interested in winning debates. They are not learning the Dharma so that they can benefit it, right? They can benefit from it. So this sutta also talks about the purpose of learning Dharma. It's a very, very important discourse, though it talks about how we should grasp the Dharma, but also learn how, what's the purpose of learning Dharma, right? Is it to win arguments, which is good if you can, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to use it so that you can actually overcome suffering, right? You can overcome suffering. If, you, uh, of course, you can use it to explain other people if you find out they are divert, diverging from what the Buddha taught. But that should not be the main purpose. The main purpose is actually to cross the samsara, right? So we go from uh, suffering to happiness. That's the purpose of learning the Dharma, right? So now, uh, of course, it talks about uh, the problem of uh, uh, wrong grasping of the Dharma because then you can suffer for a long time. Actually, not only you suffering for a long time, but also you can make others suffer for a long time. That's why it's very, very uh, important to really grasp the Dharma properly because if you, you, you start spreading it, then in this lifetime and subsequent life, people will be taking it wrongly, right? So that's why it's very, 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 very uh, important to really be very careful when you are teaching the Dharma. And probably that's why we, when we are training, we had to stay five years with our teachers. Five years. Yes, as monastics, for me, I spent eight years because I have dodged some years by coming to Uganda to establish, to establish the, the temple. <laughs> so I, so any time I, I, I was coming to Uganda, I compensated it. <laughs> yes, and also my teacher, Bante Gunaratana, would send me to Brazil to teach on his behalf. So what I did is to add on three more years on top of five years so that I really learn what he's teaching and how, uh, the proper way of delivering the Dharma and all these kind of things. We can make mistakes when you are delivering Dharma, but we should be able to correct them, all right? Sometimes uh, maybe misunderstanding the question, some, and all this. So that's why we need spiritual friends to, to, uh, so that they can uh, discuss Dhamma Sakacha, discuss the Dhamma at the right time to see areas where we can correct, you know? We make correction and amend, amends. So this simile is very, very important, and that's my favorite simile. Uh, holding the snake by the, but, but I have never done that because I'm not a snake charmer, but it will be very, very interesting to hold it and see whether it's really, <laughs> yeah, but I can see uh, how people have been uh, holding the snake, the snake charmers, you know? Yeah, so please hold by the neck, but not the tail, you know? So then we continue on uh, with the sutta. Well, this is a huge sutta. We continue on, good advising us to hold it properly. Uh, because if we have a right, I'm on page uh, 229, I mean 28, 
the Buddha is talking about uh, that we should uh, grasp the Dharma properly, the truth, in other words. Therefore, I'm concluding the simile of the snake, the, 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 of, of the snake. Therefore, because when you understand the meaning of my statement, remember, remember it accordingly. And when you do, uh, when you do not understand the meaning of my statement, then ask either me about it or the bhikkhus who are wise. This is very important. That's why uh, when we give Dharma talks, it's good to have a Q&A to clarify the points. Because sometimes, uh, why I came actually to be very interested in, in the Q&A, because sometimes I would spend almost one hour giving a talk. At the end of the talk, somebody will ask me, hey, you have not talked about Nibbana. I said, what? That's what I've been talking about all the time. <laughs> Many, many times people would ask me a question and I'd spend almost one hour, like even like teaching on, the, giving a teaching on non-self. And somebody said, Bante, if there's non-self, then who does this? I said, the whole one hour. <laughs> I've, been, I've, doing this, I've been really just explaining about that, right? So that's why it's very, very important. Uh, the Buddha is telling us that if you don't understand, ask me or ask uh, what you call, because who are wise, you know? And the good thing is that in Buddhism, uh, if you don't know the answer, then you go to the most wise person. Then you go, yes, you go to, th you, you go email to the teacher, you know? Sometimes, if I'm not clear about something, I email Bantaji. I say, Bantaji, can I do this? And then he'll reply me, you know? There are always going to be wise people somewhere, you know? Yes, <laughs> so because it's a lineage, you know? You'll find always somebody who will have, some idea to explain something other than sitting on something and you don't understand. We go to another simile, which is again uh, pointing towards uh, how we should really uh, uh, handle the Dhamma properly. It's called the simile of the raft. Uh, this simile of the raft, uh, I will summarize it that actually it's about how we should really deal with the Dhamma. What, what can we do with it? Yeah, all right, handling it properly also. All right. So uh, let's see what can we read about it. Uh, it's a beautiful simile. Uh, again, uh, uh, because I'm just starting there with because the simile of the, the draft. Yeah? The other one is, is, is a proper, uh, I mean, number 13, because I shall show the, you how to, uh, how the Dharma is similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, known for the purpose of grasping. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the bhikkhus applied. The blessed one said this. Bhikkhus, suppose a man in the course of the journey saw the great uh, expanse of water. What's that a great expanse of water? It's dukkha. <laughs> That's suffering. <laughs> That's a great expanse of water. The, the suffering is like a, a water expanse, you know? <laughs> yes. Is very and uh, and uh, is continuing. Whose shore was dangerous and fearful, and whose father shore was safe and free from fear? Hmm? What's that father shore? Is actually Nibbana, right? Nibbana. Huh? So then, uh, then he thought there is this great expanse of water, whose near shore is dangerous, right? dangerous you know the five aggregates are dangerous right <laughs> the five aggregates is the heap of dukkha right is the heap of the dukkha dukkha said the buddha you know so it's dangerous and fearful and who's for sure is free and safe of course that's in Ibana, but there's no ferry boat or bridge for going to the far shore right suppose i collect grass trees branches and leaves and bind them together into a raft a raft is the noble eightfold path, basically. And for me, the discourse is not talking about twigs. Uh, it, it didn't say what twigs are. But for me, I, my heart wants to believe those twigs. Uh, they are the, the right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action. But unfortunately, they should. I didn't see eight of them. There are still four. <laughs> so, so should I really just reduce the most important factors in the noble eightfold path? That means right view. Right and right thought, right mindfulness, right concentration. I have no idea. I wish here the Buddha helped us 
to really say about uh, the, all what I see is grass, twigs, branches, leaves, there should be stems, uh, and we buy them all together. But of course, the suitor doesn't say anything, but I, I just want to uh, think, my man wants to believe about the ingredients, the components of the Noble Eight for Path, because the Noble Eight for Path is the raft. Eh? <laughs> And the teachings of the Buddha, of course, is all for the. But here, I want to focus more on the Noble Eight for Path, right? Yeah, so now we are crossing with the raft and supposed to, uh, let's say, I suppose, suppose I collect grass, twigs, branches, and leaves and bind them together into a raft. I'm supported by a raft and making an effort with my hands and legs. Okay, the Buddha is not talking about what are those twigs and branches. I'm just suggesting that, this is just a suggestion. <laughs> you can think about other things, but for me, my heart wants to believe <laughs> that the components of that raft is what helps uh, also to bind together the raft, right? Right, if you can help to bind together. Right, mantras can help you to bind together, no this. So if I'm to add more stuff there in the raft, I would make it eight to really uh, confirm to what I think. But this is my opinion, please, if there's some of these, some other things you think about the raft, please, you can really come up with them, you know? That this is what my imagination, sense of imagination, and my understanding that this is actually made of beautiful qualities that are going to help you to cross the, the river or the ocean, whatever, right? So now uh, you have put them, of course, you have to apply effort, which is the uh, right effort, of course, and then you cross and you have arrived on the first shore, he might think that this raft has been very helpful to me since supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got it safely across to the far shore. Suppose I were to hoist it on my head or load it on my shoulder and then go wherever I want. Now, because what do you think? By doing so, would that man be doing what should be done with the raft? Of course, no, Venerable Son. By doing what, uh, by doing what, by doing what would that man be doing? What should be done with the raft? The Buddha is asking here because when a man got a, uh, got across and had arrived at the far shore, he might think thus: the raft has been very, very helpful to me, since supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. Suppose I were to hold, hold it on the dry land and set it adrift in the water and then go wherever I want. Now, because it is by, by so doing that a man would be doing what should be done hmm, uh, with the raft. So I have shown you how the Dharma is similar to a raft being for the purpose of crossing over and not for the purpose of grasping. So now, uh, this simile can be easily misunderstood. Eh? Can be easily misunderstood that when, he, when he, if you take it too literally, too literally, you can think that when you have crossed the river, you should not have right views. <laughs> you should not have right thoughts. No, 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 it's a grasping. We should not grasp, right? We should not grasp even on a dharma, right? Because uh, grasping on a dharma, eh? It's really dangerous. It's really dangerous. Is 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 even attachment to good things can be dangerous. The key is to overcome what attachment to even dharma. What so about a dharma, right? A dharma is the opposite of dharma, right? So now this is not to say that okay, you attain enlightenment, no more meditation, <laughs> uh, no more concentration. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> uh, then you start to go back to zero, you know. I don't know for we have done with these things, it has helped me, and you throw the noble for part. Actually, those people, when you look at the teaching of the Buddha, they practice 10 factors of the, 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 of, uh, the not only eight, knowledge eh, of liberation. Eh? And you, you know those 10 factors of the, the Arahant. So for me, it is very, very easy to misunderstand this raft. Yeah. It's the attachment of the Dharma that you should actually drop. Of course, similes are very good, 
but actually sometimes they leave out something that we need to understand from our experience. Because if we take too literally, then it me it, it as if that okay, once we have it's like a ladder, you know, once you've climbed, then you throw the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so, so now it means that it's as if, okay, when you've reached, eh, don't do anything that uh, based on Dharma. No, no, no. Don't be generous, be start being stingy. No, 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 no. It's not about that. It's about actually letting go of the attachment to the Dharma. This should be very clear. And I cannot overemphasize enough of that, right? about this simile, right? Because it's the attachment, the good that the Buddha was telling us to let go. Not the good itself, not the good itself, but the attachment to good because attachment is still attachment. Whether the chains are made of silver or gold, they are still chains. Are we together? You can't say, okay, these chains are made of bronze, copper. Oh, no, no, no. I like, it. I like my chain, the, the cups, you know, made of gold. They're so beautiful. No, 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 no. You are still in chain. Doesn't matter is the, is the carat, 24 carat gold cost $1 million, and they say this is uh, something is tying you, and you say this is very beautiful. No, it's still being ch chaining you, you know. So I think this is very clear that uh, the attachment to the raft that we should really let go, right? Yeah, but simile could be misunderstood. Anyway, that's my understanding also about this simile. Uh, the, the purpose of Dhamma is for crossing over samsara and reaching to Nibbana. That's why the Buddha gave that simile. Hmm? And also we should not attach even to good uh, things. What if, what even about the things which are not good? That's where we should understand the simile. If the Buddha is encouraging us that even we should not get attached to the, the, the good things, what about those things which are not good? Right? <laughs> I think Ajahn Brahm has a very good sign, uh, a good uh, caption uh, about the signpost, which is which the end of suffering, and somebody is holding on to it, you know? <laughs> end of suffering, the signpost, the end of suffering. Someone is grasping on end of suffering. <laughs> yeah, I think this is very important. So now we go to the sutta is still actually very big, but we continue on. Uh, stand, this is called standpoints for, uh, standpoints for views. Here there are six views, six views. Eh? These views, I think we should go through them very quickly. There are six of them, but these six views all pertain to the five aggregates. I'm not going to read, we're going to lose time. If I read word by word, I will just summarize. Okay, these uh, uh, views, the six views, actually uh, five of them, you know them very well, all right? It's this uh, what you call identity views, all right? About with the five aggregates, how we identify ourselves with the five aggregates. That's material form, perception, feelings, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the material form, feelings, perceptions, uh, then mental formation, consciousness, that's five already. If we take them as I, my, myself, then that's a wrong view because I is more of conceit, right? When we say I, 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 I is conceit. We use it 99% of our communication is I. I do this, I do this. That's why it's even very difficult to overcome it. And anyways, when we say that this is mine, then that's called uh, co craving craving, and that's also a big problem. We call them obsessions in Buddhism, we call them obsessions. And then when we say that this is myself, then this is what we call wrong views. So these three ways uh, times five aggregates, you can even get 15 already. <laughs> three times five is 15. But that's not what the Buddha was talking about, 15, I'm just giving you the number because each of the aggregate, you call it I, mine, myself, so you multiply by five, you get 15. So now with the six views, each of the five aggregates, we have a view for it, that's five. And then the sixth view is the view about the, the world itself, taking the world to be a self. I'm going to, uh, to, to read to you the sixth view. Uh, at least you understand those five, five, five views. Now this mind, this, uh, I'm on page 229 at the bottom of the, uh, the, the sutta in Madhmanikaya. Uh, the six views here, here, uh, 
And actually, I'm on page uh, now 230. Uh, towards the end of that subsection, uh, the Buddha said like this. And this standpoint for views, namely, that which is the self is the world. That's the sixth view, taking the self to be the world. Hmm? After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, non-subject non to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. That's what we call eternalist, eternalist views, actually, you know? <laughs> this too, he regards that, this is not my, uh, this is not mine, this is not myself, uh, this is uh, not, uh, my, okay, this is not myself. This is the correct way of looking at, but when you're looking at the wrong views, is actually uh, before that, right? Before that, we go back to page 229. Uh, that is the wrong view, uh, just somewhere, stand view for, stand points for views. Uh, I'm going to read which is a wrong view, right? Wrong view is that which is the self, is the world. After this, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, non-subject to death. I shall endure as long as eternity, right? This too is regards others, this is mine. This is, I am, this is myself. That's the wrong view. The right view is regarding that as not mine, which is on page 230, the first one I read to you. The right view is and the standpoint for views, namely that which is self is the world. After this, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, non, 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 non subject to, to change. I shall endure as long as eternal. This too, he regards this as this is not mine. This non, this I'm not, this I'm not myself. Since he regards them thus, he's not agitated about it, uh, about what is in non-existence. So this is very, very important, actually. This is very, very important to know these six point of view. They're all related to actually what you call identity views, personality views. We, we find them in Brahmanjara Sutta. Brahmanjara Sutta summarizes all the views, 62 views, basically. One of them are these ones. I think this is very clear, so straightforward. It's <laughs> very straightforward. We go to the subsection of agitation. What's this agitation? Uh, agitation uh, is on page 230, right? Uh, this is a little bit uh, involved, but let's go to it. Agitation. When this was said, a certain big asked the blessed one, Venerable Sir, can, this, can there be agitation about what's non existence externally? And of course, of course, later on uh, at 20, the Buddha also talks, uh, talks about agitation, about what's non-existence internally. When you look at the notes uh, at the back of the sutta, what is really defined to agitation, non-existence externally and non-existence internally, when it's external, is about the wilding despair over the loss of, uh, of non-acquisition of, of position when somebody that cannot get things in a wild way uh, externally, and then they'll despair. So they will get agitated basically. But uh, I think we, what's more philosophical uh, is more of the non-existence internally because that introduces us to a very, very important uh, uh, thing, most, the misunderstanding of Buddha's teaching, all right? This, ex this externalist despair when they mis uh, misinterpret the Buddha's teaching on Nibbana and they call it as a doctrine of annihilation. Because when the Buddha taught about Nibbana, some people thought that he was teaching annihilation actually. So then people get agitated. This is very, very important to understand. So now uh, you can read the suttas pretty much straightforward. I don't see a, a very a diff difficult thing to understand, but there's one passage that you really need to know that I'm going to read. Very, very important to know, right? It's, it's on uh, subsection 20. No, no, after 20. Uh, I'm going to read it. After, you, you, can you see 20? 20 in Majimanika? Yeah, 20 subsection. Oh, agitation as a, uh, as, as a subsection. Down there on 20, all right? Uh, I'm going to read there straight away, right? Because there are so many mental states that you need to understand. Venerable sir, can there be agitation about what is non-existence internally, right? 
uh, uh, internally. I've already explained you this. So there can be Biku, the blessed one said. Here Biku, someone has the view. That which is self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, and not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. This is what we call actually eternalist views, right? So he, he hears the Tathagata, or a disciple of the Tathagata, teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoint of view. So the teaching is Tathagata is for eliminating all standpoint of view. I think this is very, very important because uh, most people think it's about existence or non-existence. But actually, Buddha's teaching was actually overcoming that. That's why the Buddha talked about dependent origination, right? It's not about externalist view, or annihilation, or non-existence, or existence. It's about that everything is dependent on arising, codependent co arising, right? And that's why most of the time people are asking the Buddha, sometimes he kept quiet, because he, he said that, oh, if I answer this, people are going to misunderstand, right? It's for elimination of all kinds of views. Most people say that the Buddha is pessimistic, others they say is optimistic. No, no, no. The Buddha is just realistic when he was teaching, right? This is, most people think that way, you know? And that's why when you look at the Buddha's teaching, uh, when you look at the background of Buddha's teaching, there were 62 views. Buddha didn't want to bring the 63rd view. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can even talk about those as a religion. There were 62 religions during the when the Buddha arose. So he didn't want to bring the Dharma, which brings another 62. So his teaching is not a view. <laughs> yes, he's actually to eliminate all what standpoints. It's very clear here. Decision and obsessions. You know, obsessions, that's what I, mine, and myself, you, those are called obsessions, adherences, and underlying tendencies, anusa, it's called anusaya for stealing the formation, uh, for the relinquishment of all attachment, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana. Okay, the word dispassion is very, very important here. The Pali word is called viraga. Viraga, raga is actually like gluing, glue, gluing. Viraga is not gluing, not attached, in other words. But the word dispassion here in English, it sounds a bit like negative, eh? but actually this is a positive mental state. It's a positive mental state. Uh, it's not about neg negative or dispassion and many other uh, translations, but for me, I would say, uh, I will take it uh, as it's in Pali language, not gluing on to the conditioned things in the world. Let's put it this way. It's better than using the word dispassion, right? Because it sounds as if it's a negative uh, things towards the exist, uh, these uh, five aggregates. All right. Mm -hmm. For cessation for Nibbana, I continue on uh, at the last, of the, the last part of the page. He thinks thus, so I shall be annihilated, mm -hmm. so I shall perish, so I shall be none more, no more, then he sorrows. Those are agitations, griefs, and laments. He weeps, uh, beating his breast and becomes distraught. That's how this agitation with, uh, about what's uh, non-existence internally, right? Uh, and then, of course, it continues on to the uh, uh, venerosa. Can there be no agitation uh, about what's non existence internally. So you read the sutta, I think you'll be able to understand that. It's very clear, it's straightforward, right? So now we go to impermanence and non-self. Impermanence and non-self, uh, again, this is a teaching of the Buddha that you should really understand. And uh, it's so rotating around the, this, what you call uh, the doctrine of self. And in many ways, I think um, Arita, the, this uh, uh, what you call pernicious views based on misunderstanding of this teaching, right? So now, uh, if you want to understand this part of the sutta, you need to refer to Anatta Lakana Sutta. Anatta Lakana Sutta. Uh, in Anatta Lakana Sutta, the Buddha actually 
uh, was talking about some the, what you call question and answer. Because the Buddha was asking, hey, what do you think, monks? Is what is impermanent? Uh, uh, suffering or not suffering? And then he would give the combination. I think we'll waste a lot of time if we were to go through word by word. What you need to remember in this section of impermanence and non-self is uh, probably uh, uh, about, uh, let's see, let me see what you need to remember about this, uh, namely impermanence, everlasting. Then uh, what do you think in material form? Okay, go to 26, oh no, 27. I think that's what you have to remember, the 11 aspects the 11 aspects of the five aggregates, number 27, all right? You have to remember that those aspects of what? Of the five aggregates. Huh? There are 11 of them. Uh, we need to, uh, to, to draw our attention to them. There are 11 aspects of the five aggregates, all right? We are going to count them. We are on 27, are we together? Therefore, because any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, one, future, present, three, eternal, internal, eternal, five, gross, or subtle, seven, inferior or superior, what, nine, hmm? then uh, far or near, that's 11. The, these are called 11 aspects of the five aggregates of clinging. So each of them has 11. So if you multiply by five, that's 55. <laughs> 55 of, uh, this is very, very important. And I request you so that you really uh, draw your attention uh, because uh, uh, he didn't give this for just as a passing thought. It was basically covering the whole aspect of our experience, right? The whole aspect of our exp experience. Uh, you can look at, uh, you can look at uh, all our experiences in life. Eh? Some are near, some are far, some are, you can count them, they're 11. Hmm? They're 11. If they are less, you tell me that they're 11. I've already studied them, all right? They're 11 of them. So now, some like external, right? External, right? External, uh, that means uh, there's a frequency sound. They can be internal sound and external sound. They might be gross or near, or few or near or far, superior or inferior. Basically, this covers the whole of our experience. Because sometimes people are meditating. Sometimes people meditate and say, oh, I saw this. I saw this light. Oh, I saw this in meditation. As if there's something strange. <laughs> this is within five aggregates. <laughs> this is five aggregates. Sometimes people say, I say, I say, okay, please do like this. Can't you see light when you do like this? <laughs> I told them to do like this, their eye, you know, like this. <laughs> so sometimes people bring some experience as if there's something beyond the five aggregates. So next time when you meditate or what, try to look at whatever arises in your experience and, and boil it down to these 11 experiences, right? <laughs> Some experience can be subtle, something can be gross, sometimes can be superior, inferior, sometimes external, internal, sometimes like this. So these are, I think, very important point. And this is covering the whole of our experiences in the world because it's only five agree that we can perceive the world. When we have these five agrees of clinging, that's how we can see the world. We can see in, uh, beyond, you know, far away, you know. So this, but that's still part of our experience. It's not outside our experiences. Are we together? Yes. So now, uh, in other words, what is, uh, it's like Anatla uh, Sutta, that whatever is permanent, right, is suffering, and whatever is permanent suffering is non-self. That's all what he's talking about, this thing. Uh, we don't need to stay more, more, more about this. So long as you remember those 11 aspects of the five aggregates, they are impermanent, and uh, and each do kanata. That's it. That's what you have to remember with this. All right. So and with that kind of understanding and practice, actually, you can overcome this uh, belief in a self. And I want to draw your attention. Why did the Buddha teach the noble effort path 
and people attain only stream entry. The reason is actually they never went beyond stream entry. If they still, because they are Brahmin, Brahmin is in the past. <laughs> so they still believed, believed in the self that which is going to attain enlightenment. <laughs> they had a strong belief in a sense of self. That's why the Buddha brought a big patch and taught Anatolakana Sutta and all of them attained Arahantship. And there were six Arahants to the five, uh, five disciples. He had five disciples. And then uh, at that time when he taught, then they become six Arahants in the world, all right, including the Buddha who was teaching them. So, but they, they were stuck. They were stuck. They attained stream entry. So this is very, very important teaching because with non-self, the teaching on non-self, you really actually let go of oh, the strong sense of self, strong sense of self, right? Uh, then we continue on Arahant, number page 233. 233, uh, this is also something you should know uh, with Arahant is, uh, let me see Arahant, Arahant. And the aspect of Arahant is more of uh, explaining what the, uh, how to reach the, the, that stage of Arahantship. It's about talking about 10 fetters. I think you know about 10 fetters. There's the five lower fetters and the five uh, higher fetters. So this part of the section is talking about, uh, let's say read the first sentence, then you can get some idea. Bikus. This bhikkhu is called one who crossed the bar. Again, the, uh, Buddha gave about five, uh, five, uh, five similes here. Let me see. Uh, five similes. He talks about uh, a crossbar which has been lifted, a trench which has been filled, pillars that have been uprooted, and uh, the, without a bolt. Again, these things are rotating around what you call the fetters, right? If you understand the 10 fetters, you understand this section very well because he's talking about an arahant, he's the one who has overcome all the 10 fetters, the 10 fetters. And, uh, you, you remember them? Hmm? Uh, personal, uh, uh, what you call personality view or identity view. And then there's what to call skeptical doubt, we have uh, attachment rights and rituals, right? When you do that, you actually attain stream entry. Right? But then with the second level is called uh, once returner, then you attenuate, you don't actually eradicate, you attenuate greed and ill will, then you attain what you call the second level, which is called uh, Sakadagan, right? Sakadagan. Then, uh, then you the, you have the five. Uh, the, the if you, the two are really overcome, then you overcome all the five fetters. We call them lower fetters. Then you reach what you call anagan, right? That means non-returner. And then you have five four fetters. We call them five higher fetters. One is craving for fine material existence, craving for uh, immaterial existence, and then there's what we call conceit uh, with mana, uh, conceit, there's restlessness, and then we have uh, ignorance. When you overcome that, you have attained arahanship, right? So now this sutta is not, is very straightforward, all right? If you know the five aggregates, um, the, 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 I mean the, the, the fetters, 10 fetters, and then how the, uh, the process of overcoming these five fetters. But there's one point that you need to remember in this sutta, right? Uh, Buddha, when he was giving this sutta, there's something that he mentioned that you need to pay attention that uh, is very, very profound. And it's in the sentence number 26, uh, verse 26, Arahantship is on page 233, because, hmm? because when gods with Indra, with Brahma, and the, uh, uh, Pajapati seek a bhikkhu who is thus liberated in mind, they don't find anything of which they could say the conscience of the one has gone is supported by this. Why is that? One thus gone, I say. 
is untraceable here now. Now this brings to a very, very important point in this discourse. This other hand, this other hand, <laughs> uh, if somebody has attained, if the man is liberated, uh, no, you cannot trace. Because if somebody say, uh, of course, uh, this person has attained and attained, you know, after death, where is he gone? <laughs> This is a very big question, right? With somebody who's uh, overcome all the 10 fetters, you call another hand, where has he gone? The Buddha, of course, in other sutta gave similes of the, of the fire and, and uh, ocean, and like if you stop fire, and then it, you can't say it has gone uh, south or north and all the kind of thing. So, uh, so now, uh, we, I think to understand this uh, part of the sutta, we need to go to the miss miss uh, presentation of the Tathagata, right? And then the sutta will be about to finish in two minutes. <laughs> okay, it's one hour, but I think we'll extend a bit. Okay, uh, let's continue on. I think you appreciate more when we read also the, uh, this part, okay? Misrepresentation of the Tathagata. Tathagata, the word Tathagata is an epithet the Buddha gave to himself and of course, this word used to be there even before the Buddha, but probably the Buddha adapted it and used it. So saying, I'm reading 37, page 234. So saying, because, so proclaiming, I have been baseless, vainly, forestly, and wrongly misrepresented by the Rukruses and Brahmas, Brahmins, thus, the Rukrus Gatama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation. The, the destruction, the extermination of the existing being. As I am known, as I do not proclaim, so I have been baseless, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by some Rukruses and Brahmins. Thus, the Rukrus Gotama is one who leads astray. He teaches an annihilation, the destruction, and the extermination of the existing being. Thus, because both formally and now, what I teach is suffering and the cessation of suffering. If others abuse, revile, uh, revile, scold, and harass the Tathagata for that, the Tathagata on that account feels no annoyance, bitterness, and rejection of the heart. Right? The sutta keep on going and going on and on and on. So what you should understand in this part is this one, that the Tathagata thus gone, Hmm? Because also the Tathagata is what? Is the Arahant, you know? So let me combine the two. So according to the commentary, they say that when even the Tathagata is alive here now, there's no self, there's no self already, there's no being per se, right? So you cannot really actually uh, say that it's annihilation, but there's no, you know, that's what one thing you should understand according to the notes Bikubodi gave. But also according to the commentary, say that people who are like waddling and because Nibbana is already a concept, this the mind has attained Nibbana. In other words, the mind which has attained Nibbana has taken Nibbana as the object. So now the waddling people, the people, the, the Putujana, cannot really perceive this kind of being who has overcome this kind of, uh, who has attained this state. These states are called chitta, vipassana chitta, magga chitta, and pala chitta. In other words, um, um, this is uh, uh, insight mind, right? The, the path mind and the fruit mind. Those are levels of enlightenment, right? So I think combine these two, uh, uh, you really find out that uh, um, it's not about teaching annihilation, yeah, of this kind of tatagata, uh, but um, this is a misunderstanding people have actually. So now we go to a very, very important uh, part of the sutta, which I don't have to read everything. It's called Not Yours, in page 234. Not Yours. Now, this is a little bit confusing. You need to really understand where, in what concept, concept the Buddha is talking about Not Yours. Let me read the discourse. Therefore, because whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. What is, what is it that is not yours? Material form, uh, of course, feeling, perception, and, and so on, and consciousness. Now, my friends, 
How about let's let us remove our eyes from the from the from the, from the suitor. Now you go and go and take me for lunch hmm? in one of those places you take me when I come to Singapore. And then he asked me, "Hey, Band, how is your food? How was the food? Ah, uh, the food is not mine. Uh, is it uh, test good? No, test is not mine. <laughs> so they put. <laughs> so, no, I think this will be very, very, very uh, not good actually. <laughs> they put us it's not ours. So now, Bante, how the temples in Uganda? The temple is not yours." It's not mine. <laughs> so, so we should understand this in two levels. One is relative level, and one in ultimate level. On the relative level, material form, feelings, perception is ours, right? Relatively speaking, right? But in ultimate sense, it's not ours, right? Because everything is rising and passing away. We cannot own it. If we can own it, if we can own it, we could say, okay, let me live longer. Let, let my liver issues stop now. But because actually the body is not mine, I still have liver problems. My liver. <laughs> so, I mean, if the liver was mine, my liver, the organ, eh? not river, the, 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 the river, uh, liver. If it was really mine, I possess it, uh, uh, I would say, no, no, please. The enzymes should stay in a range which is zero to 50. Now, yesterday I checked my liver, my liver enzymes, it is 143. It's gone haywire, and there's very little I can do. I can't go to Singapore uh, to go to. <laughs> so now, actually, more so, I see that my liver is not mine. But on one level, my liver is mine. I have to take medicine, I have to take care of it. I mean, all my devotees and friends in Singapore, they will be disappointed if I don't take medicine. And they ask you, Bante, why are you taking medicine for the liver? Ah, no, the liver is not mine. <laughs> and the Buddha told us to give up what's not ours, you know? <laughs> so we should really understand that, okay, not yours is on a relative level and ultimate level. On a relative level is the five aggregates subject to clean, they're not ours, right? Yes. On one level, uh, on one level, relative levels, yes, the, 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 the hours, we should take care of them. But on ultimate level, they are not ours, just processes. Actually, these are verbs, are processes, right? So I think I don't have to read one word by one word. So we go in the last section, it's called in this Dharma. This section, all what you have to understand in this Dharma is of course the different levels of enlightenment, other hardship, non returner, once returner, returner. There's two points you need to remember only here that if you actually love or have faith in the Buddha, right, you can go to heaven. But heaven is just actually a, a transit in the Buddhism. So two people who are unable to attain this any of the four and that means stream entry and uh, and uh, uh, once return and non return and arahanship, there is another consolation prize for this. It's called faith follower and dharma follower. Faith follower is called actually in Pali is called sadda sadda nusari. Hmm? Sadda uh, sadda is called sadda. Uh, Sadda, let's see. Yeah, so these are the people, uh, these are people who follow us. They are called faith followers. Eh? Sadda Nusari. Eh? Sadda Anusari. Then, then there's Dhamma followers. Faith followers, these are the people who, who, who actually are led by faith. In other words, out of the five spiritual faculties. You know the five spiritual faculties? One is faith. Energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. The more strong these five faculties, the more you reach the, the, the stream entry. If you're stronger, you, you attain the second level of enlightenment. Even if stronger, the strongest one, who has these spiritual faculties which are very strong, the strongest one is Arahanship. But if they're weaker, you, one of them, you, 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 and you take faith out of the five, as your main lead to, uh, the, uh, to these teachings, then we call them faith followers, all right? Faith followers, 
they, are, they have insight, right? But they have not attained enlightenment. And Dharma followers, they take wisdom as their lead, right? So these are, uh, they're not yet uh, stream enterers, but actually they, these, these teaching later on, they can follow it and then can proceed on to the path to liberation. And then the one thing that I want to remind you about this, uh, this uh, last part of the discourse in this Dharma is about the patchwork. The Buddha's teaching has no patchwork. In other words, uh, don't patch it. It's complete in itself. Be good in the beginning, good in the, in the middle, good in the end, right? There's no patchwork. Of course, we have a problem around the world where the people see, think that Buddha's teaching is not uh, complete and they bring a lot of teaching, they smuggle them in, but actually it's okay if you are using a, a Dharma teaching to illustrate what the Buddha taught in their examples and the one more experience. But if you feel that Buddha's teaching is not perfect, and you think that you are going to bring another teaching to put it so that you prop it. That's what the Buddha say that this is like a drum. If you keep on putting patches on a drum, it's going to lose its sound. The Buddha cautioned that, all right? So it's complete as it is. There's no patchwork, free from all these patchworks. I think with that, I'd like to end the sutta. The sutta ends like this, right? Let me say that uh, I want to end the sutta because the Dharma well proclaimed by me Thus is clear, open, evident, and free from free of patchwork. In the Dharma well proclaimed by me, thus, this is clear, open, evident, and free from patchwork. Those who have sufficient faith in me, huh? sufficient love for me, all are headed to for heaven. Now, if you have faith in the Buddha, <laughs> you go to heaven. So in this discourse, we can find the justification of having faith in the Buddha that we go to heaven. But we need to gain, of course, stream entry. And in stream entry, faith alone is not enough. We have to use, uh, you have to strengthen all the five speech of faculties. faculties. Finally, the sutta say like this, that is what the blessed one said, the bhikkhus we are satisfied and delighted, and the blessed one in, in the blessed is what? Sadhu, 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 sadhu. So now that, that's the end of the sutta. I'm sorry it took uh, one hour and 10 minutes, but this sutta takes three hours. If I were to explain it thoroughly and read it, everything, but this is what I can do in the summer of the sutta. Thank you very much for listening. May you be well, happy and peaceful. May you grasp the, the Dharma by, properly by the head, but not by the tail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mante. Can we, treat, can we say three sadhus, please? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you very much. And please send my meta to all Singaporeans, all Indonesian brothers and sisters, all the Dhamma brothers and sisters. I miss you. And I hope the COVID will end and uh, I come and we share Dhamma there in the BF. Thank you, Bante. And we hope that, yes, and we really hope that Bante will come to Singapore again. We would love to see you again and you can share your Dharma again with all of us in Singapore again. Thank you very, very much. You are welcome. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, you are welcome. You are welcome. Here are the announcements. Please do tune in again next Sunday on the 11th of October for another inspiring talk by Sister Sylvia Bay. This talk is entitled Death and Beyond, Teachings from the Pali Canon. This Sunday service will be live streamed at 10.30 a.m. If you have benefited from our talks, do consider donating to the Buddhist Fellowship so that we can continue our Dharma activities. We run mainly on donations and every little bit counts. Thank you all very much. Dedication of Merits Let us invite all sentient beings to participate in our acquired merits. Etta vata cha amhehi Samparang punya samparang Sabbe dewa anumodantu Sabba sampati siddhya Etta vata cha amhehi Sampadang punya sampadang, sabbe buta anumodantu, 
sabba sampati sitiya etta vata cha amhehi sampatang punya sampatang sabbe satta anumodantu sabba sampati sitiya Let us dedicate the merits of participating in this wholesome Dhamma activity to our departed relatives and friends. Idang menya tinang ho tu sukita hon tu nya tayo. Idang menya tinang ho tu sukita hon tu nya tayo. Idang menya tinang ho tu sukita hon tu nya tayo. Sadu, 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 